and there are uh, some oddball ones, but the ones that I'm presenting are types that we see over and over again. So this is a math block. Uh, this dial goes way back. Uh, the Mathemir test has an early form of half block on it, or had. Uh, uh, with the half block, the half is fastened to the lid, sometimes on the outside like this one is, and sometimes on the inside. Uh, and the half comes down with a staple on it that goes into the lock, and a bolt in the lock then retains the staple. This one has a keyhole cover, and uh, we'll talk about that when we get into details about each type. The next one. This is a single pivoting hook lock. Uh, you, when you see a single slot in the top of the lock uh, that is narrow like this one is, uh, then that's probably the type of lock it is. Usually they're centered, but this one's a little off center. Uh, there's, there's always some variation. Next style is the two hook sliding rack. And those will be Slightly offset, it's a little hard to tell in this photograph, but you'll see it in another one. And there are two hooks on a rack that is moved by the key, and the hooks retain two staples in the lid instead of one, like the single hook. Next style is a crab lock, which grabs a arrowhead-shaped keeper on the lid. And this picture is from the Horse Folk Museum collection, has the keeper with the arrowhead shape on it uh, in the in the picture. That, that you can see the two grabs that are pinching it. The lock looks odd. I think somebody has flattened this lock out for uh, display. The, the piece you see at the top of the holes would normally be made flat over the top edge of the front board of the chest. And the last style is uh, a very old one and less common than the others. Uh, this is a, I, I've been calling this a, a opposing spring hook. So there are two hooks that push outwards and the key uh, which contacts the piece you see going down into the ward box there where you see the little keyhole shape and the pin uh, act, actuates that and pulls both hooks in to release the two staples of the lid. Now we'll go through with some details on each style. Tom, can we try something quick? Um, sure. Your audio is just a little bit garbled. I think it might be a connection. Something uh -oh. that might help just for now is if you turn your video off, it will boost your audio signal a little bit. Um, we sure. won't get to see your, your face, but it might make the audio just a little bit clearer. Okay. So does that help? That does help, yep. Okay. Uh, so this picture shows different types of keepers for the lid. So the one at the bottom is a hasp that would fasten the lid and enter the front of the lock contained by a bolt. The one just above that is the arrowhead shaped piece that uh, would go into the crab lock and be pinched on both sides. Uh, the, the little point of the arrowhead parts the two hooks and then they snap closed over the top of it. The one at the very top is a single staple. Well, we'll see some that have two of those and some that have one. Often when they're two, they're connected on a bar like the far left. Uh, where there are two staples fastened to the bar that goes on the lid. Uh, you'll see on the back of that bar, there's a point, and that's for locating, once you've got your lock installed on the front of the front board of the chest, you close the lid with the keeper in the lock. So these two staples would be in the lock, the plate would be on the top of the lock, and that point then would make a mark in the lid to show you where to fasten the keeper to the lid. Same thing with the single staple above, the bent part that takes the pivot that goes through the lid would keep the staple from going too far into the lock and the spike then would make a depression in the wood of the lid. That tells you where to fasten that to the lid. The one that has the keeper for the crab lock that has the arrowhead shape on it also has a spike. And then when you're, when you're doing the hasp block, you would mount the hasp first and then mount the lock where the hasp fits into it. So what, the next picture is the uh, hasp lock. And the first line of defense in most locks is the keyhole. If the keyhole is wrong shape for your key, that prevents the key 
going in at all. Uh, some locks have one more line of defense, which is a cover to the keyhole that you have to know about. So on this one, if you see the little rivet to the right of the keyhole cover, there's a, you can see a little dark slot below it. So if that rivet is pushed down, the keyhole cover will pop open. Next slide should be a little video of that being actuated. So there's, you can see a spring on the inside of the keyhole cover that makes it pop open. Next video shows what's happening on the inside of the lock. This lock, luckily for us, because there's no key with this lock, this, this lock is, uh, is not locked. And because it requires a key to draw the bolts back, so the staple can be passed into the lock and then retained, it's unlocked. So we're able to get into the chest because it's not locked, but we're not able to lock it because we don't have the key. This slide shows the keyhole with the pin. Uh, the pin is a mechanical feature around which the key pivots. And that supports the key against the pressure of the different spring-loaded pieces that it's contacting the lock. And it's also a, another layer of defense. A key that doesn't have a hole that's big enough can't fit over that pin. Uh, so on some locks, the pin is really large and the wall of the tubular key is slim. It also gets in the way. If you're trying to pick the lock by putting things into the keyhole, that pin is in the way. Next slide. This shows three different types of pins. Uh, the, one on the left is the cheapest, simplest type. That's just a file tenon on the end of the pin. The one in the middle is bent over in an L shape and would take a rivet. That gives more support to the pin. The one on the far right has two holes in it for rivets and gives the best support to the pin in the center of the board box. So the ones that are just tenoned in, especially in thinner sheet metal, don't hold up. You'll often find them wiggly the lock and sometimes miss it. This shows the inside of the lock. See the little hook that's in the top center. The little hook is over that spring. The spring in the middle top is connected on the left to the pivot. Yeah, you can see the slot there. The other two springs are pushing two bolts forward. And so the key into the ward box, which is the lower piece that has the little notches cut out of the corners and has a T-shaped pin on it. You can even see the rivet down below. The one up top has been filed enough that it's hard to see. But uh, so that's got a T-shaped pin, which is the strongest type. It has two bolts that have to be contacted by the key and then wards inside to prevent the wrong key from rotating to contact the bolt. Uh, we won't be discussing the wards in this presentation, that would be enough for a whole other presentation. This 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 uh, chest has a, a different approach to keyhole cover. That diamond-shaped carving above the spiral in the front covers the keyhole, and the piece of wood slides side. And then the pictures of people covering the. Can other people see the keyhole in this one? Keyholes to the right, and I can't see it because it's covered by pictures at the distance. Oh, um, something you can do if if you're on the screen, everyone, and you can't see what's on the right, but you have that little film strip, uh, you can hit the minus symbol in the top left of that film strip, and the whole film strip will disappear. Did that work for you, Tom? That oh, and some did you just circle the keyhole now? That's good. So the one on the left is the, the diamond-shaped block over the key hole, and the one on the right is the diamond-shaped block, which been, has been slid in a groove in each of the pieces of molding above and below to expose the keyhole. So that's just a, an interesting approach to hiding the keyhole. Next slide. So this is a, a production version of a, a bolt. Now, now it's no longer a uh, hasp lock. It's, it's got a small staple that comes from the lid 
these parts have probably been punched out on a punch press and uh, every lock comes out the same. There could be small variations. The key is very simple, it's probably a swage key. It's been drilled on the end to go over the pin. Earlier ones, would, the key would be rolled up too because the, the common blacksmith didn't have any way of drilling out solid iron to make a hole in it. Next slide shows a combination. So there's a bolt, there, there are two staples on this uh, little bar above. And you can see the corners have been turned up so that those locate the keeper on the lid. They make the mark close the label. So there's a pivoting hook and there's a bolt. In so it's another uh, mass produced block, but it uh, has two different mechanisms. Next slide will show the, this this lock has a simple pivoting hook. This is one that's on display all the time. Many of these pieces are in the a stored collection. This is on display all the time. You can't see the inside of the lock, but you can see it has a single slot surface top. Next slide is a closer discussion of the lock and open. Next slide then shows, you can see the hook inside. That would be moved when the key hits the bottom of the, the, the piece is a, a long piece that has a pivot point. The key hits the piece on the other side of the pivot point so that the hook is moved out of the way. Next slide then shows the keeper in the lid. This is what they look like when they're installed. The spike goes through and is clinched on the top and there's a large headed rivet uh, on top that teamed over the pad on the bottom. Next slide is another lock that has a, another chest that has a similar lock. There's very nice iron work on this chest. I like the way the uh, straps are slightly domed to make them more uh, substantial looking. Next slide shows the keyhole. You can see the pin inside the lock over which the key must fit. Next slide shows the, the here the slot is centered. This is the top of the lock. You can see the hook inside there. Next slide shows the back of the lock. Uh, in the bottom, you see the, the L-shaped uh, pin support. They're often spread in a little triangular shape like this. Sometimes they're decorated. The other uh, rivets you see coming through are different parts of the lock. So the one directly above the uh, L-shaped pin is the pin around which the hook pivots. The one up above is a pin to stop the hook from going too far. But then the one on the right, lower right, is the spring that pushes against the hook. Uh, the two on the left probably hold some type of ward that the key has to pass. Here's a close up of the staple on the top of that lock. You can see the wear on the staple from striking the hook. Next slide. So this is one in my collection that is not in a chest. And so you can see what the pivoting hook looks like. There's a little uh, bar that retains the, keep the spring on the hook and then prevents the hook from going so far forward that it doesn't strike the keeper in the right place see the pin and the ward box. The two little tenons in the face of the ward box, uh, yes, are uh, either end of a circular ward, a ring ward, that the key would have to pass it. Next slide shows, this is uh, three pivoting hooks all ganged together, but each one has its own lever that the key has to strike. So the key needs to avoid the wards and hit all three of these levers to open this lock. On the, on the right, you see the back side of the lock and they've used the L-shaped uh, mounting for the pin that the key goes around and for each of the pins on which the hook pivots. Next slide shows the key, which gives us some idea of how complex the wards are inside this lock. You could see from looking at the lock, it was, uh, and forged, the, the 
piece of metal was all hammered out. It was not factory rolled sheet like the uh, production pieces were. It was not terribly straight or smooth, but uh, it's fairly complex that the blacksmith was accomplished. There's extra ornamentation in the bow of this key. This little piece was assembled and tucked into the tube. The tube of the key would come all the way up through that collar uh, just below the bow, which is the ring on the end. And all the ends of those little scrolls would be welded together and then tucked into the tube when the bow was raised on and notch cut across the top. Of it. Next slide moves us on to the sliding rack type of uh, lock. You can see it has two hooks, two staples in the lid on a very nicely decoratively pierced discussion. This is also one that's on display all the time. Best of mine. There's the lock in the chest. You can see the two slots. From here, you can't tell if they're offset, but in a later picture, you'll see the, the, the two slots are not centered. Uh, here, you can see the wear on the staples. I'm not sure why there are two marks of wear on the right staple and only one on the left. If there were two in each, I would say that over the years, the did shrink and the hook inside the lock struck a different place. But uh, it may be that one hook got bent at some point to struck a different place on the staple there. You see where the strap that was decoratively cut was laid over the horizontal strap and welded together. And you can see, you can even see the grain in the staple on the left. The wrought iron had a grain to it because of the way it was manufactured. Yeah, there you that's the grain uh, that would follow the staple was bent so that grain would follow the staple all the way around and make it uh, stronger than if you just cut a notch out of a flat piece. The next slide shows the lock and there you can see that the two slots are offset on the lock. This, the pin in this lock has a large tenon on the end but it is just a, a simple tenon. You can see from the roughness of that uh, metal that that iron was hand hammered sheet, not, not something that was rolled in a mill. Next slide shows the escutcheon. It has a pointed pin. Uh, the pointed pin makes it easier to get the key in. It doesn't give you quite as much protection as a blunt pin that fills more of the keyhole. Next slide shows one that was, is, is in the Vestheim collection that is off of a chest. So you can see the inside. Uh, notice the file decoration on the hook. Once this lock is installed on the inside front board of the chest, that will never show again. Uh, I don't know whether the lock was sold and displayed and uh, then people could see that and buy it and put it on a chest or whether the blacks are thinking the lock just couldn't avoid doing some kind of decoration for his own amusement. Uh, there's a damaged staple on the right. The part of it's been broken off uh, and probably that was in an opening chest. These chests lock every time they're closed. The slope hook uh, flexes the, the rack and lets the staple come in and then the rack snaps back because of the spring on the right. So every time the chest is closed, that lock is locked. And when a key is lost, then there's often damage done getting it open. The next slide shows one in my collection that also has some file decoration on the inside. Uh, so it, it shows that, that wasn't highly unusual on the other one that's done by more than one blacksmith. Uh, it also has some nice little notches cut out of the ward box. You can see on this one, there are two wards missing. Um, maybe that at some point the ward was torn out to make it possible to use a different key inside the lock, sometimes done by antique dealers trying to resell things with a key that doesn't fit. Uh, th this one also shows a little bit of decorative uh, profiling on the flange around the edge of the lock through which nail holes pass that would hold the lock into the chest. Uh, we see that on some of them, but others are just, they made that sheet as wide as they can get it and left as wide as the sheet on the edge. Next slide then shows a chest that has a um, nice discussion with the 
chisel piercing that has a date that we'll have a close up. So the date that was painted was in the uh, 1800s, but the date chiseled into the escutcheon is 1711. I think the date that was painted was 1806. Uh, here I don't see a, a pin. Uh, I think the lock's been removed from this one, but you can see the two staples above. So that it would either be the opposing hook style or the sliding rack style. Next slide shows the the wear on the, the uh, well, it shows it on one. It, you'll see later it's on both on one side, on the same side. So it shows it with the, the sliding rack block. Uh, one more slide then shows that you see the metal bar that staples are attached to. Next slide then shows the back of this block. Uh, that's hand hammered sheet. The next slide shows the inside of the lock. Uh, so you can see it is the two hook. This is the lock that's been removed from the chest. There's decorative work on the bottoms of these hooks. And the plate in the middle, I believe, probably is, is something on which there's a tumbler fast. Tumbler is a, another mechanism inside the lock, which would be a further defense. He would have to strike the tumbler and lift it out of the way to allow the, the rack in this case, and in other cases, bolt to fly. Uh, so that it gives you something you have to get around the boards and strike two things. On. Next slide shows a combination of a sliding rack and a pivoting hook. So one spring presses on the lack, well, the, excuse me, one spring presses on the sliding rack and the other spring presses on the hook. At some point, you could see the metal on the top of this was smashed down. I'm not sure if that was in somebody prying the lid, somebody prying the lid open or, or what that's from. At some point, this was removed from the chest, perhaps because the chest was locked. Next slide. This is on to the crab lock style. So here you have two. They're more blunt than the other hooks, but they're like hooks. Uh, Two hooks or grabs that pinch the keeper that comes in the top. But you can possibly see a little slot. That top where you see the opening. Yes, that's two different pieces. So the one on the right is L-shaped and the one on the left is straight. So those two enclose the keeper and hold it locked in the locked position. Uh, one advantage to this type of lock is that you have even pressure on both sides of the keeper, so it's not as likely to get loose or bent. The other advantage is you have greater room for that keeper to move as the lid expands and contracts, uh, expands with humid weather and then contracts with slow drying over years. Uh, in a lot of locks that I've worked on, you cannot even close them because the lid shrinks enough that the staples won't enter the lock. Next picture shows the one where the keeper is in there. You can see the two tabs between the ends of the spring, which is the C-shaped part at the bottom. Those come up and pinch the two, the two grabs together. Those are pivoted just below the spring. There's a piece hidden by that plate that the key strikes and it hits one of the grabs just above its pivot point and hits the other one further above the pivot point. So that piece is made with one end uh, longer than the other so that you ideally push the two grabs equally apart. Uh, and a lot of old locks, one opens more than the other. As long as they both open enough, you're gonna have the lock in. Next slide then shows the last style lock. This is the opposing hook. Those both, both are sprung outwards by that spring in the middle. And the key pushes the, the uh, often it's called a talon that reaches down into the board box. The, on the one on the right, there's a little arm that goes down into the board box. The key would push that to the right, pivoting the hook 
on the top to the left and pressing down on the other one, uh, pivoting the hook on the left one inwards also. That would release the staples on the lid. Next slide is, uh, oh, this is another one from the uh, Park uh, Folk Museum collection. So both of the crab locks were from the North Folk Museum collection, and this one is also. We didn't find any examples of these two styles in the uh, Bestheim collection. The Bestheim has a number of chests that are locked, and there were some that were too high uh, to get into easily to inspect uh, in the storage. But if you ever visit the storage collection, the one whole side of the room is shrunk with uh, elaborate paintings and elaborate ironwork. It's really inspiration. Uh, so we, we, I went wondering whether these styles were not used in Norway. I went to the, the online and uh, was directed to the North Folk Museum and they had some examples that shows that they were used, but maybe not as much. This is one in my collection, and I added that just to show that the other was not uh, a unique version. Uh, see on the two hooks some decorative file work below the hook that will never show once this is nailed into the chest. You can see this very crude bot iron. Uh, you can see a crack, a delamination for the bottom. Somebody has removed the ward box from this. I don't know if that was part of opening the chest or whether it's just some messing around. So that finishes this part of the our program. All right. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you for this presentation.